Good evening and welcome to tonight's live event, Deep Dives number three, The Lives of Lighthouse Keepers. We are live on the Thames Festival Trust Facebook page and YouTube channel. My name is Marietta Evans and tonight I'm inviting you to an in-depth exploration of life as a lighthouse keeper. This event is part of London's Lost Village, a project funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and the Trinity Boy Wolf Trust. So a big thank you to all of our partners to ma for making tonight possible. Uh, joining us tonight, we hope to have two former lighthouse keepers who undertook training delivered by Trinity House at Trinity Boy Wolf, and they will recount their time spent learning their trade as well as their memories of life spent keeping lighthouses. It's time to say hello to one of our two guests tonight, uh, Neil Harbris. Uh, Neil, uh, thank you very much for coming and joining uh, us this evening. You're welcome, Marietta. Nice to be here. <laughs> Can I just double check? How do I pronounce your surname? Hargreaves? Hargreaves, yes. And we're also expecting uh, Barry Graham Hawkins with us this evening, but he's just having some uh, technical problems connecting. We hope that he will be able to uh, fix that. We did do a test yesterday and I could hear and see uh, Barry perfectly. So, Fingers crossed, it's just something momentarily, and he will be able to join us uh, very soon or later this evening. Now, of course, if you are watching this live, you can also be part of the conversation. So what about typing a comment with a question for Neil or Neil and Barry later? Uh, I mean, I'm sure you have a lot of questions about life as a lighthouse keeper. I surely do. Or do you just can type a comment to let us know what you think of the conversation or yes, to let us know from where are you watching us this evening. And now to really get into the swing of things, let's have a look at some pictures of what Trinity Boy Wolf is and was in this little music video. Now, for uh, some of you who don't know what Trinity Boy Wolf is or what it is, let's get you up to speed. Uh, this is what Trinity Boy Wolf looks like today. It is now a creative and culture and educational site. And this is where it is located. If you're not very familiar with the area, you can see it's just in that bend of the river between the Isle of Dogs, Canary Wharf, and the Royal Dogs. And we can also see it uh, in this map, in this chain, chain tool map from 1953. 
For nearly 200 years, this land was used as a lifeboat dock, boy storage facility, and maintenance uh, depot, as well as for testing new lighthouse technologies. It is the place where we can find London's only lighthouse built, and if I'm wrong, I'm sure Neil will correct me later, built, I believe, between uh, 1864 to 1866, and it was also the place where they trained new lighthouse keepers as our guests, guests, well, guests and hopefully guests in plural uh, tonight. Uh, Neil, I, I guess my first question is, um, why do you want to be a lighthouse keeper? Is this something you always wanted to do as a child? Is it a, a movie you watch, a book you read? Uh, I, I can't honestly say it was, but it was a progression of... Uh, I was actually at sea um, before that. Uh, I was trawling. Um, first out of Fleetwood, uh, up Iceland. And then when Iceland was coming to a close, I went, I moved through to Loistoff and was fishing out of Loistoff, the North Sea. And um, it was, well, I was in the pub one day, one of the chaps I got talking to her, he said, uh, oh, they're looking for people on the light ship. She said, and it's um, a month, month on, month off. I said, month on, month off. I said, yes, well, that sounds good, month on, month off. Because on the trawler, you were only in dock three days and you were out again. <laughs> so, uh, and obviously you could be out in all, all sorts of weathers as well on a trawler, but of course being on a light vessel, you were also out in rough weather. <laughs> but, uh, and you, you couldn't run for cover on a light vessel, but the month on, month off was attractive. So is, I went along to Great Yarmouth Depot, which was just 10 miles up the, up the coast from Lewisau. Um, I saw Mr. Bedenfield, who was the district clerk there at the time, and got a job on the light vessels. And I was on the new light vessel, mm -hmm. uh, which is where I, I was most of the time in light vessel service time, which I was only on them two years. And they just sent me to the Humber light vessel once when they were short-handed there one time. But uh, other than that, I was on the new. And after two years, I transferred over to the lighthouse side of the service. So most of the time in Trinity House was actually spent on lighthouses. And when did you arrive to Trinity Boy Wharf? And why did you decide, where? why were you sent to train at Trinity Boy Wharf? Well, I was sent to Trinity Boy Wharf to do training as a light, to be a lighthouse keeper. I'd already done my light vessel training, but that was done in Harwich, um, where the um, main control depot is today. Uh, all the lights are controlled from Harwich in um, in the UK and, and Gibraltar. And um, but the when I transferred over to the lighthouse side, I had to go for further training um, because there were different engines um, and they covered everything <laughs> from bread making to the weather. Uh, <laughs> but of course, there were other things as well. There was um, Outer light IOBs, because they still had the odd IOB light in, in lighthouses. And I actually served on a, on a lighthouse where they still had an IOB before before it was electrified. An IOB was an incandescent oil burner. And um, these, these were lit by a gas mantle. And they were quite delicate to set up. And you had to, during the course of the night, during the night when the light was lit, you had to break the jets out every so often so they didn't clog up. <laughs> so they were they were a lot more difficult to look after. But uh, it was it was certainly uh, when I did go on to a incandescent oil burner light, which is St. Mary's Island um, off Whitley Bay. And um, it was certainly, it was like living in the past <laughs> being uh, you know, with that kind of light because you had to do your actual watch up in the service room as well, just below the light. Because at that time, those type of lights as well, the revolving light was wound up by, it was kept running by weights. Every time the weights got down, you had to wind it back up again. So that had to be done every half hour on some lights. Um, so you, had to, you had to just have your watch up, um, up in the service room, just, just below the lantern. But... Um, 
And then other things, of course, it was Morse code. You signal in, you had to learn the oldest lamp, which you you, you could, if the tender, tender was coming to give you oil and water at the end of the Monday, sometimes flash you to ask you something on, on the oldest lamp. So you had to reply. Um, ship to saw radio, you had to get your radio ticket. Well, I'd already had my radio ticket, but um, that was another thing they, they did at, Har at um, Blackwall as well which was your ship to shore radio ticket. Um, this is it. Yeah, I've still got it. <laughs> it's, uh, yes, we can see it there, yes. Restricted certificate of compensate, radio telephony. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, and other props I've got is uh this is a 3.5 kilowatt uh -huh. lamp and these were the type of lamps in use um uh with, with other than when electrification came in this is sort of lamp that, that they'd use on first order optics and um these new things we, we used to have to keep these in and after a thousand hours we'd automatically replace them but once the stock company making these, when they started, when automation came along, when they started buying less, the company stopped producing them. So we'd have to keep them going until they actually fell over before we changed one <laughs> to, a, to a spare that we had. But um, these now have been replaced by an LED about that big. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the other things, of course, were... They taught you how to change engine oil and filter because you had to do that at the end of each mm -hmm. month, um, ready for the crew coming aboard. Um, radio beacons you had to learn about. Uh, we had a radio beacon on the lighthouse. Uh, these were these sent out a specific signal, which a ship could pick up, and there'd be three in your area, so a ship in between would get triangulation, and they could pinpoint where they were. Mm -hmm. Um, phonetic alphabet you also learned, of course. Um, this again, um, uh, I, I knew already from being on the on the trawlers. Uh, I knew my phonetic alphabet from there. But um, and also uh, <laughs> for, for for those who are not very familiar, it's like when we say A for alpha. That's right. B for tango. Yeah, correct. Yeah. That's because correct. if you if you are talking on the radio to people and it and it's very difficult to understand that they, and yes. it's very crucial that they know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Then, I mean that is an international language. <laughs> so you can say, um, well, "Do you do you remember it?" So I I learned it long ago and I oh, have yeah. it. And it's like I have, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> I have, yeah, yeah. Because so um, some examples: B for Bravo. B for Bravo. Yeah, I always remember T for tango. I find it like very uplifting because it's like dancing. Yeah, well, and... the, the, the helicopter we used to use um, when they started doing the reliefs with helicopter, it was boat relief to begin with. But the, the tele helicopter we used was Tango Charlie. So uh -huh. it was the same helicopter we used all the time. So <laughs> we, always, we always remembered Tango Charlie and that's the one you looked out for when relief day came. <laughs> uh, Neil, uh, let's go. I, I'm going to retrace our, our steps a bit because I've got some photos I want to show and I want you to talk to me about those memories in connection mm. also with the photos we have. So, um, obviously, this photo I think is older from your time at Trinity yes. Boy Wolf. But, um, yes. and I, I, I well, you have explained that there was a lot of training you did before going there and a lot of other training you had to go after being at Trinity Boy Wharf. But what do you remember of the place? Uh, what was going on at the Trinity Boy Wharf at the, at the time? I mean, you were there doing your lighthouse, uh, part of your lighthouse training. Uh, how do you remember the place? and uh, What else was happening there? It, it was a complete hive of activity because they had all the different trades tradesmen there working there, where the, the as well as the... Uh, mechanics and electricians and radio mechanics what were based there what went on to out onto lighthouses and light vessels to do repairs they also had their own workshops making their own lighthouse parts because some of them as you can imagine some of the lighthouse parts they weren't on the shelf mm -hmm. and they often trinity house often made made their own parts up when they wanted something they had coppersmiths there tinsmiths 
uh, you name it, the trade was there, you know. And so there was lots of workshops there. And there wasn't an American diner in the front of it like there is nowadays, of course. <laughs> and there wasn't a cafe, but they, they did have their own in-house, on-site um, uh, canteen, which we had our lunches on-site, in the can our dinners on-site in the canteen. Because as well as all the work trades, they had all the office staff there to go with it as well, obviously. Hmm. So it was quite a hive of activity. And all the painters painting the used to do the repairs to the boys when they came when they were brought brought in there and they'd re they'd repaint the boys chip, chip them all off all the rust off and repaint them ready to go out on station again somewhere else and if if we if we look at this photo overhauling boy lunch and flash it what is this man doing this is a photo taken at trinity boy wolf yeah it's uh, the flashes are again they, they have a on the top of every boy is a, is a light which flashes a certain signal and yachtsmen uh, fish, fishermen any ship, any ship going past they know what the lights are what the lights mean um so like for instance in the rivers going in and out the rivers they have starboard and port and and the yachts the yachts rely on these uh, when they're coming in and out of port in, in into the rivers, and likewise out on the out on the seas, you have boys marking certain stations, and depending what flash it is, uh, they know exactly you know what that boy's where that boy is, what what it's marking. Some mark a sandbank, um, some mark rocks, reefs, uh, and it also you have your wreck boys, of course, which mark mark uh, a wreck site. And what about um, this, these photos? What memories trigger these photos? Yeah, that, that's the type of IOB, um, which you can see the, the gas mantle, uh, which is holding up in front of the keepers looking on there. That round white thing is, is a gas mantle. But um, it's, that's a, a type, one of the types of all, old IOBs. But again, as I say, it was an uh, incandescent oil burner. But um, and those lanterns on the other picture, um, they're, well, they're they're small, they're smaller lenses than, than the first order optics. But the they had third and fourth order optics, which were smaller. But also some of these type of lanterns could be put on on a on a boy as well. But um, the uh, I see there's a, a chap there just just checking them as well. <laughs> so there were. Everything had to be inspected and checked before it went out, of course, and double checked because they always had a, a backup and not just one backup, but a second and third backup on the lighthouse if a, if a light failed. And does, does, does this uh, photo uh, look familiar? Like, w were there big vessels stopping by at Trinity Boy Wharf at the time? Yes, the the tenders, the Trinity House tenders would could come alongside there and unload the the boys um, and load it onto the wharf there uh, for them to be repaired and repainted. But um, the, uh, the the tenders at that time, uh, well, in my time, there were the THV Mermaid, which which went out to Great Yarmouth Depot, and and they had the Winston Churchill and uh, the Patricia and um, they were the Vestal and um, they, they still well, still got one called the Vestal these days <laughs> but, um, and they, they still have the Patricia these uh, as well but um, she's about to get replaced by a, a more modern modern vessel and what about the, I mean the uh, I had never thought of how long are the chains of a ship of a boat is that is that well, what we're looking at in this photo? Yeah, the the chain lengths. Yeah, they because on light vessels, um, they didn't a light vessel didn't have its own engines where you could get under steam to go anywhere. You were there permanently anchored to where you, what you were guarding, whether it be a sandbank or or a rocky reef. On most of them were on the east coast, which were they were mostly sandbanks, and um, it was only the rocky reefs was off the west coast. But um, East Coast were sandbanks, but the uh, 
the inner dowsing where I was was um, initially um, a, a light vessel before it got made into uh, a lighthouse got put there, and uh, that sat in um, when the lighthouse got put there. Well, it was it sat on a, a rig which sat on four legs, but it was in fifty feet of water there. But some going further out, they were in much deeper water, of course. Mm -hmm. So you just had you had to have enough cable. Uh, for a specific station, and you had to have enough in cable standing by in your in your hold, um, in cable in the chain locker. But in rough weather, you had to pay more cable out, wait for uh, to ride the waves so it didn't snatch at the, at the anchor. And for those of us who don't really know a lot about the technical side of it, I know you already introduced us a bit earlier but what's what's the basics of a lighthouse how does it work i mean what's the main aim is like letting ships come in about um the the, uh, the dangers in that particular uh, port or beach or harbor where they are arriving it's about um letting them know about the weather conditions it's about them having visibility if you had to explain from zero what is a lighthouse what, what does a lighthouse role yeah, sure. They, they were put there initially from the very first one to save lives at sea. And that's exactly what they've done all over the years to save the mariner. And the good thing about it is with lighthouses, um, it's not just to save your own mariners around your own coast. It's to save the mariner from any country, no matter where he's from. <laughs> that's the, that's the uh, role of a lighthouse. And... And for example, what are we looking at in this photo? Uh, the fog, the, the fog bank, because where the lighthouse is, uh, with fog in between, you wouldn't see that vessel. Um, like, for instance, when I was on a light vessel, um, when we were sounding for fog, we had to do our watch out on deck because you couldn't mm -hmm. see anything. You couldn't see if any ship was near you. Mm -hmm. But when we sounded the fog signal, it would hit the side of a vessel if there was one there and rebound back. And you'd know how quickly that sound rebounded back to you, how far that ship was away. Um, this is something you picked up, you know, you, you, that you learned. And if it got too close, you'd have to call everybody out on deck, ready to abandon ship if it, if it, that, that what, what was needed. Um, it did happen on the odd occasion when I was on the, on the new light vessel, but, Luckily, we never had to abandon ship. But as, after I left, it, the, that same light vessel did get actually get hit twice. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can see that Barry is trying to connect, but unfortunately, we keep getting a message that his devices are not connected. Barry, if you can hear me, uh, there's nothing I can do from my side. It's for some reason... It looks like the system thinks that your camera and your microphone are not connected. I don't know if there's anything you can change to go back to the settings that we had yesterday when the, when we did uh, the test. Because I, I was chatting yesterday with Barry on this very same studio and it went really, really well. I mean, like, I'm heartbroken that we keep having this problem now. Uh, also because, for example, Barry had sent us this photo it's not a photo actually it's a painting that he did uh this is uh this oh, is brilliant. i think uh, um i think the ra the radio studio i think we, the radio room I, I think was it was the name of of this uh painting that he did so again this is um uh, um the credit to this is uh barry graham hawkins who um uh, after a career as a lighthouse keeper he has also uh now take into painting uh anil what do you, what can you tell us about this room what is happening in this room well it is uh he's got a picture there the the single sideband radio that's a ship to shore radio what we use to use to communicate with other ships and um they had quite a long range that's the bigger of the two radios okay. um single sideband they had quite a very long range the, the smaller one on the left was um, uh, the one for the helicopter. Um, and we, we used to use that for community, the, that had uh, on, on separate airways for the helicopter. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a small one up on the wall was a smaller FM set, 
which we started using more with uh, for FM on the FM sig signals. But uh, yeah, it's quite a great picture that. <laughs> That's. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, so, we, we, okay so we I think we may have found a way of having uh, Barry somehow with us. Uh, Barry, I can see your messages on the private chat. So he, you can't see Barry on the screen, but I can see him on the private chat. And Barry saying, "This is the radio lounge on Landy South Lighthouse." So uh, Barry, thank you very much. And if you can't. If you can't connect with the audio and video, uh, at, at least I can see we, we have some sort of communication uh, with you. And I think I'm going to have my assistant, a.k.a. my husband, calling you to ask you if you would like to try with your phone. It might not be as good as when we did it yesterday with the computer, but even if it's not perfect quality, but we could get you on your phone clicking on the, if you go to your on your phone, open any internet browser on your phone and click on the link that I send you. Perhaps that would work. If not, let's keep uh, on the uh, on the chat option. And we also have uh, this again. It's a painting uh, from Barry, uh, Europa Point, uh, Gibraltar. And some of these photos I have selected for when I was going to ask both Neil and Harry about what it really is to live in a lighthouse. You have explained to us the technology and the technical side of it. I want to get a feeling uh, of what it's like to be in a lighthouse. I mean, uh, are you alone? How many people are there? Is your family with you? How do you get there? How do you get your food? What happens in the case of an emergency? I think you mentioned before uh, some of the training sometimes even involved baking bread. Is that in case that there was no food available? Yeah, that's there were, well. There were there were three of you in a crew on on the granite tower, type of light There were three of you in a crew, um, but on the granite towers, you all shared the same. The three of you shared the same bedroom. You had three bunks, and they were sort of partly curved bunks because they followed they followed the wall, were at the circular wall, so you were in curved bunks. But uh, the uh, on the smalls where I was first got made up as an assistant keeper on the smalls lighthouse. That was the furthest one out um, off the Pembrokeshire coast um, on a rocky reef. And um, your first watch of a morning, there were three, the three of you covered, you did a 24 7 watch. And the first watch in the morning was four in the morning till midday. And that's when most of the work, your work for the day was carried out, um, whether it was um, something in the engine room or um, cleaning the lens or you, you'd do it you'd use a morning to do your, your chores as it were and um the next watch was mid midday till eight but some split it some did midday till four then four till eight then eight till midnight and then midnight till four in the morning was your middle watch and of course it, when your middle watch you were you were on your own during that time uh, for the middle watch, because on a granite shower, that's when you did your your, your wash at the kitchen sink. You no <laughs> shower, no shower you, it was a strip wash at the sink, stood in a bowl. <laughs> and uh, the ablutions on a on a granite shower was what we call the bucket and chuck it method, mm -hmm. making sure which way the wind was blowing first, so you didn't get your own back. But um, <laughs> but it was, I mean, it might, it, yeah, I suppose it does seem prim primitive, but it it was. It worked, you know, um, there was great camaraderie. So, you know, when you were with a good crew, it, it, the, the month passed very quickly and um, it, it worked. It was the best job I've ever had, to, to be honest. But, um, yeah, we learned, you learn how to bake bread just in case. You, there was, although having said that, on when I joined, there was, there was actually a really, although the, we, you went out once a month, there was actually a relief every two weeks because you weren't out with the same ones for the whole watch. There'd, there'd be a, a relief halfway through, uh, even on with three on a on a on a mm -hmm. lighthouse. So you would be two weeks at the lighthouse. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then no, taking I'm, back to coast. No, I'll be out for a whole month. Uh -huh. But, but um, I go out. Um, so, so, I, so I went out with the principal keeper on my uh -huh. relief, and then two weeks into our relief. One of the keepers that was on there when we went out there, 
uh, he, he'd go ashore for his yeah. month off. Another one had come out for the to do another two weeks with us. Um, and then he'd stay out for another two weeks. Hmm. Um, so there was a relief every two weeks. So he, he could ask, I mean, you took your month's supply of food out with you. Uh-huh. Um, but if you wanted, you could have, you know, if you were running out, you could have bits come in two weeks. You could have order something uh, for something to come in two weeks' time. Mm-hmm. So there wasn't, honestly, during my time, there wasn't that much bread making going on on the, on the lighthouse. Um, but although I, I did, you, you did, when I was on the light vessels, I was shown how to, like, being on the East Coast, Mm-hmm. With the Suffolk and Norfolk people, I was shown how to make Norfolk dumplings. Oh. And these went down very well because they were all oh, they were a simple thing like flour, salt, and water. You steamed them so they this, this, this spread, they fluffed up really big. And you had these with your meat and, and veg and lashings of onion gravy. So they went down a treat. <laughs> and um, have you ever been in a situation where the storm was so big? And the waves were so big that that you 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 felt you were in danger. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been on I've been on the smalls and I've been on the, on the long ships off Land's End when a wave has come right over the top, and uh, that in the, when you the kitchen window where you'd be sat, um, usually a little bit of the kitchen window. You get your beer for a minute to be a complete blackout because the water had come right over the top, and uh, you'd also when a wave like that hit the tower, you'd feel it just a slight movement. But it's designed yeah. like that. It, that's okay. how it's designed to have that little give because if okay. not, it would snap. <laughs> okay, so but, it's like uh, it's like the um, the the some of the big buildings, some of the tall buildings in Japan, I think they have built to have some sort of oscillation in case of, a, of an earthquake. earthquake. For earthquakes, yeah. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I, I googled, I went and did um, a, a image search on Google, uh, joining the words wave and lighthouse keep and lighthouse. And uh, some of the photos are really terrifying. Uh, so it's not only that, I mean, if you, if you do have some windows, how is the glass of those windows protected so the water does not smash the windows? Well, we, we, we had our outer shutters when the, when a storm was coming. We had outer shutters, what we could, uh, th- these were made out of gun metal because the windows was on the inner part of the lighthouse and the gun metal shutters were on the outer part. And they were, they were two feet apart because the walls were two feet thick, the granite blocks. But uh, so you'd, you'd you'd shut your outer your outer shut metal shutters. Same with, with the with the door, um, the lighthouse door, which was at the top of the dog steps. Um, the uh, you had gun metal, heavy gun metal doors, which you'd close up uh, as well um, when when a storm was was on the way. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, hello. What, hello, Barry. Can you hear us? There he ah, is. He's there. He's there. <laughs> I can see him. I think. This is the man we have been waiting for since we started. Hello, Barry. <laughs> can you, can you, okay, can, can you hear me? Can, yes, we can. Can you hear me? Yes. Brilliant. I've got an echo. <laughs> I, I know you do, but I, I'd rather have you with an echo than don't have you at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very weak it's a very weak signal, I think. Yeah, yeah. I'm 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 gonna and we're gonna try to keep you in the show, Barry, and uh, I'm gonna say to you if this does not work like this. We will record an interview with you and we'll post it on the Facebook page and the YouTube. But let's see if we can if we can keep you here. I was just asking Neil about stories of living in a lighthouse, about uh, how do you get your food? Does it get dangerous when you have a big storm? Tell us some stories and memories about what it is what is what it's really like to, to live in a lighthouse. Yeah, um, 
the food, we had to uh, take that out with us. We had to go and buy it before, and then it was taken out either on the boat or um, or mainly as the release by helicopter. And um, you just had to make sure that you got all you needed for the uh, the two weeks. There was a relief every two weeks on the lighthouses, so that wasn't too bad a problem, really. Some people used to get just sausages and tins of beans. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, Barry, even if your, your video is freezing, your audio is really good. So I think, I think even, even if your video does freeze, I can hear you perfectly. And that's really, really, really good. Um, I, I'm just going to go back with you to, with some questions that I had asked Neil. Uh, I was very curious to hear, uh, Neil told me his story. In your case, what made you want to be a lighthouse keeper? And now we have lost your audio. We can't hear you now. Barry, we suddenly can't hear you, I'm afraid. Oh, that's really sad. It's really no, sad just... that he's having all of the... uh, Barry, uh, can, you t can you talk to us? No, we've, we've lost your audio again. I'm, I'm afraid we have lost your audio again. I'm really, I'm really frustrated because I really want to, uh, Barry to be part of the conversation because I think it's Barry who sent us this photo um, of a Christmas hamper being delivered at a lighthouse. And I really wanted to ask Barry about it. Uh, Barry, let's see if we can get your audio again. Um, can you talk to us? Can you tell me about your memories of being at the lighthouse? No, we, we, we've, mm -hmm. we've lost, we've lost, uh, Barry, uh, Neil, since we yeah. had this photo that I, I think, it was, was it me, Barry, was it you who sent me this photo? Yeah, Barry. Um, wh what about Christmas and a special holidays? And if you had to, if you had to be the one staying at the lighthouse for Christmas or New Year's Eve, how did the crew try to, uh, keep festive and in good spirits? Yeah, we, uh, yeah, I was often out, uh, out at Christmas time, I Remember one of the one of the really best Christmases I had out there was on on the Inner Dowsing Tower, and at the time I'd CB radio was in, and I'd I'd take the CB radio out with me, and I used to speak to the people ashore, in on um, the Lincolnshire coast, uh -huh. and and on the Norfolk coast, and the people in in Lincolnshire what used to talk to me. Um, come Christmas, we suddenly got because. The helicopter we used to use, Tango Charlie, they had a they they were based at Strubby in Lincolnshire, Strubby Airfield in Lincolnshire. And one of the friends who I used to speak to on CB radio, he knew one of the pilots, um, Jeff um, Jeff Bond, who was the uh, one of the brothers that owned the helicopter company. And he went and saw him, and uh, they had this. They, the people, the CB radio people, had collected this huge amp, put this huge hamper together. And they'd gone along to the helicopter people and asked them to drop it out for us. They had no problem with dropping it out. We, I was on watch one morning and suddenly got a call on the radio from the helicopter because they used to go past us. The same company used to go out and relieve the, the oil and gas rigs. Mm -hmm. And we suddenly got a call one morning and um, he said, we, you need to stand by with the helicopter going to land and get your firefighting equipment ready so we did, we had to do this every time a helicopter landed of course they could get the firefighting equipment out but i also called the other two guys out to be standing by as well and um they landed this helicopter and out the back we pulled this huge christmas hamper what my cb friends have put together in lincolnshire and uh it was fantastic it had everything in there and uh that christmas i remember was so we had an especially good christmas and uh what we usually did to, our, to entertain ourselves, because being on a rig, um, I went from a granite tower to that rig. It mm -hmm. was an ex-coal rig, what they used to drill for coal off the northeast mm -hmm. coast, because mm -hmm. a lot of the coal seams ran out under the sea up the northeast. And um, so being a rig, we had our own, we had, so, uh, we, I went from being in a one bedroom with three, three of us to having my own cabin. Uh, we had a separate lounge for the TV, TV lounge. We had a, a galley with a separate dining area. And we had showers, toilets. <laughs> um, so 
in the TV lounge uh, Christmas time, we we each took it in turn to 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 do a turn, either sing a song or recite a poem or or some words, and uh, all three of us took part in it. So it it went down very well. It was a good Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, obviously, you have just described a situation in which. You are not in an ideal, ideal situation, but you managed to make the most of it. And uh, you and I were talking just before the, the show was started about how many journalists uh, contacted uh, you and, and some of your uh, former colleagues uh, uh, through the uh, National Lighthouse Keepers Association, uh, wanting to hear your thoughts on isolation. What lessons can we learn from isolations from people like yourself who have worked as a lighthouse keeper and you had to face way before us some of the situations that we faced during the pandemic and being in lockdown and, um, and actually I found that there was an article on the Independent about it uh, with you and we also have thanks to you the original photo uh, that's you uh, Neil, uh, but yeah, I, I I think this is a very good angle. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, exactly as this article described, what are the the lessons or the uh, the thoughts that you can share with us about what you have learned about isolation? Well, being out on a isolated spot, I mean, lots of lighthouse keepers, most of them, and sit with same on the light vessels. Uh, we had hobbies. Uh, whether it's putting ships in bottles or painting, like Barry was an artist, of course. Um, there was other artists as well in the job. Um, there were, I did a, a lot of photography as well, um, because the wildlife, you know, you, you saw the wildlife and the nature at its rawest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was, um, it, it was good. And the, the, the types of hobbies were, right across the board i mean so some guys even did knitting or some made rugs and things like that you know it was uh, quite varied um and some were wood wood turning um they, they made toys for the kids that were, and that when they were out there and uh so you, you know you kept yourself busy in your in your downtime with, with doing things like that and of course i did a, i did a heck of a lot of reading out there as well um, I prefer factual to fictional, but I'd, I read some fiction, but I did prefer fact. So I learned quite an awful lot out there <laughs> just <laughs> by reading. <laughs> Talking about reading again, it's such a pity that we keep having these problems with uh, us. So it's a pity that Barry, poor guy, keeps having these uh, uh, technical problems to connect because he sent me this photo, which... Uh, is, this might be a book that he wrote when he, uh, as a way of killing time, when he was a lighthouse keeper. Scary stories to tell in the dark. Uh, Barry Hawkins. I think Barry was a lighthouse keeper at somewhere called. Is it Scary? Is a place, uh, Neil? The Scurries, yeah. The the Scurries is is off um, off Anglesey, uh, mm -hmm. North Wales. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, there's one or two lighthouse keepers have written um, books as well. Um, the uh, God Medlicott has right, written quite a lot of articles. He was mm -hmm. a principal keeper. Uh, and other keepers have written books. Even um, one of the daughters of a lighthouse keeper has written a book on her life of being on a lighthouse because she was born and brought up in one she got married from one she got <laughs> at st mary's island what's connected by a causeway she has a wedding photograph taken on the causeway <laughs> because let's let, let's try to understand what was life for the families of a lighthouse keeper so you you are doing a stint of a month right in, a, mm, in the lighthouse. for a month, month out month month on month off yeah and is your family living uh on like on the main line but very close to where your lighthouse is they are living on the coast in front of you more or less so ha, ha, uh, some some might have done but they um with with my family my uh, my wife lived uh, ashore in in our house ashore but um 
when I was sent on the Smalls, uh, I was living in East Anglia at the time, mm -hmm. but the Smalls is off the west coast of Wales. So that's from extreme east to extreme west. So I was well away from 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 my home. But um, on some uh, land stations, that's where keepers lived there with their families on a mm -hmm. land station. Mm -hmm. Before eventually, with automation, they made them into rock stations. So the families were then moved out eventually and they became rock stations. And they put four keepers there instead of the three what was there before. But um, during the automation side of it. And also during the automation side of it, the, the last uh, four years I was put on what was known as a pool of keepers. We got sent relieving people that were off sick or on holiday. So in them last years, I got sent England, Wales and the Channel Islands, uh, a month here, a month there. So I got to see a lot more lighthouses than what I would have done normally. That was great because, <laughs> you know, you, you got, like I say, I got to see a lot more places. Not only that, but wherever you got sent as a lighthouse keeper, you were immediately welcomed into the local community. <laughs> they saw you as one of them because you were there to protect their fishermen, their yachtsmen. And that was, it was great life. You know, you were welcomed into the community straight away. And on, when I got sent to Alderney on the Channel Islands, the lighthouse, we was also the 999 call centre for the island. Oh, we, wow. were, we were the only place manned 24 7. It was the same on SAC. There was the 999 call centre to the island. So we'd turn out the fireplace or ambulance. <laughs> uh, Neil, uh, talking about emergencies, what has been the scariest? or most dangerous situation that you have been involved, either scary and dangerous for yourself because of, I don't know, perhaps the, the lighthouse was being, the safety of the lighthouse was being compromised, or scary because it was something could have happened to a boat you, was, you were trying to help? Well, I suppose the scariest one was, I suppose for me, when I was on a light vessel, when a, a ship came that close, it scraped along down our starboard side. Um, the, the little coasters, what you supplied, they got, they're not supposed to come across a light ship's head, but invariably they did. And there was a four and a half knot tide running there because it's quite a strong tide. So they struggled once they struck, once you started crossing your head, they were coming ever and ever to, nearer to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, a lot of them was only had the little coasters called mm -hmm. callers, only had three of a crew. And so if the one on, on the bridge, went down and made himself a cup of tea, put it on the Iron Man, the automatic pilot. Because you'd look on the bridge and we'd, you couldn't see anybody. So you'd have to sound your fog signal to let them know they were running into danger. But, um, yeah, they'd been scraped down the port side. Uh, that that was the closest to, 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 to what I came. But, um, as I said, after that, after I left the light vessel, she actually got hit twice and hauled, mm -hmm. hauled, actually hauled on the second occasion. Wow. But another incident I had when I was on the endowsing, I had um, the helicopter people who I said did our reliefs, they had a helicopter coming in from one of the rigs um, mm -hmm. to, to go to land at Strubby in Lincolnshire. And he said, we've got um, a problem with our chopper coming in from one of the gas rigs. He said, can he land on your deck because he's losing oil? I said, yeah, sure. So I called the guys out. We got started by with the extinguishers and this helicopter came in and what was left of his oil finished up on our deck. And I, you, you, we were taught how to guide helicopters, mm -hmm. coming, of course. So I guided him to nearest, as far as, to one end of the pad as I, as I dare. Mm -hmm. We had to get a second helicopter to come in and land, uh, which was possible with it being the inner dowsing tower, with being the next rig, we could get another small chopper in down alongside. So they sent another chopper from Strubby uh, with the mechanic on board and fixed him up, and then they were both able to fly off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Neil, um, what about the situation today? Are lighthouses still being kept by, by, by people? Are they all uh, automatic, all digital, and we don't have lighthouse keepers anymore? No, all, all I was a fully automatic. There are still some around the world in some countries, but most countries have automated now. Um, the uh, in, in India, there's still some. Uh, there were still some in, in Canada, but they were wanting to 
to automate as well that do i think they were resisting <laughs> <laughs> but um america fully automated long time sweden mm. was the first to automate okay but um the uh is it because it's the shipping companies that pay for the service you see mm. none of the uh, payment for lighthouses and light vessels or boys comes mm. from the taxpayer it gets mm. paid for by the shipping companies okay and the money gets paid into the treasury by the shipping companies every year and then the treasury allots so much back to Trinity House to run the service mm -hmm. uh, that's how, that's how it works but um yeah it's a shame going back to what we we're saying before because Barry uh, we actually did a made a DVD of interviewing keepers before while well, some okay. of us are still, while well, some of us are still here um the LK had in a DVD made of interviewing keepers and Barry Hawkins interview was very good and very poignant because he was on watch the night when the Penley lifeboat got lost with all hands and he heard it over the radio what was happening you know and it was very sad and it was very poignant it was very sad listening to Barry tell re relate that story yeah. you know well, I, I think Barry has not been able to connect, but I think he can. He, he's following the conversation. And I wanted to say to Barry, Barry, I've got so many questions for you that I couldn't ask today. Um, I'm very sorry. We have never had a problem like this before because, as I said at the beginning, Barry and I were here on this virtual studio yesterday and everything worked perfectly. And suddenly there's something, some sort of glitch blocking his camera mm. and he has not been able to join us, even if we did uh, uh, take. And I have had my husband off screen <laughs> spending the evening on trying to find a solution. But it's one of those things that everything on the system is saying is fine, but it's just not working. Um, so, Barry, I'm going to do is I'm going to see, I'm going to suggest um, to my wonderful colleagues at the Thames Festival that I get in touch with you and we record a video interview with you with all of the questions that I was not able to ask today and then we upload the video to the Thames Festival Facebook and YouTube as well because there's so many things we wanted to ask you and, and so many stories we wanted to hear from you and uh, but I do want to say thank you both to Neil thank you very much Neil for your time with us tonight and I got a final question to Neil but while I know that Barry is listening I want to say thank you to Barry as well because he sent me a lot of photos and a lot of his paintings I have used some of them not all of them because I felt it was not uh, fair to use those images without Barry being able to, to talk about them but Barry I'm gonna save everything that you sent me and hopefully we can arrange to record a video interview with you and we can upload it later uh, in the new year on the Thames Festival. Uh, Neil, just before we close the show, have you been back to Trinity Boy Wharf, to that area? And if you have, well, I'm sure you have been shocked at how much it's changed. Yes, I, I have. I've been back more than once because we actually run ALK tours there every now and again because um, we do a tour, we have a tour of the boy yard and then a tour of Trinity House uh, as well the same day. But um, yeah, it's, it's changed dramatically. Uh, now it's surrounded by blocks of new flats. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there the used to be dock, dock workers' cottages, but um, now it's all new flats, so it's surrounded by. And it's like a... It's like a little oasis now. <laughs> but, I, um, and of course, it's got the American diner in front of it, plus, plus the cafe. Which you did say before, that you, you did not used to have a diner when we were there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the, Ball, the Ball Creek Cafe there is quite nice as well. And it's nice because they have artists living there, um, what both live and work in those um, containers, what have been converted into um, accommodation and studios. And um, and because every time you go there, there's always something new to see. So yeah. it, it's well worth a visit. Well yeah, worth a visit. I, I absolutely, absolutely agree. I mean, for anybody who loves uh, maritime history, you have to go to places like Trinity Boy Wharf. You have to go to places like the Royal Docks. You have to go to places like even Canary Wharf and Canada Water. If you know where mm. to look, there are still some some places with with a history plaque, and you see the water and those places are living histories. Uh, it's very difficult for people now to understand and to see, but those places were like the biggest port 
in the world. And in the yeah. middle of that, we had Trinity Boy Wolf training amazing, brave lighthouse keepers like Neil. And uh, Neil, thank you very much. And to everybody who has been watching this evening, I know, for example, Hilary has been watching, Matthew as well. Thank you very much. And thank you for your comments. And thank you for joining us. My apologies for the technical problems that meant we could not bring Barry uh, on a screen. But here's my promise. I'm going to do my best to interview Barry and upload the interview uh, in the new year. And well, I, I say in the new year because we are nearly in Christmas. So I'm going to say good night. Thank you very much. And to everybody, have an amazing holiday. Thank you. Merry Christmas to everybody.